Welcome to Form Now. I'm Tim Gray, President of the Augustine Institute, and joining me is Matthew Meeks, who is our Chief Marketing Officer and Innovation Officer here at the Augustine Institute. And we're going to be talking today is the Feast of St. Junipero Serra, this great, great Franciscan saint who was recently canonized by Pope Francis. And uh, he's in the news of late, unfortunately, because people have been wanting to tear down his statues in different places as part of uh, some of the, the mob uh, destruction that's going on in different cities and urban places where people just want to get rid of any statues of anybody. And uh, that's unfortunate because, you know, St. Hanipro Serra is quite a remarkable man. And I think there's a false understanding of people have shallow idea that here is this guy who came from Europe and, you know, he kind of uh, preached to the Indians in California. And, and of course, St. Hanipro Serra is very, very important because he founded all the missions. Yep. Uh, nine missions, and then there was other later missions founded in California, but nine missions that he established. He established the first missions in California, and uh, they're beautiful missions, and it really, so much of the history of California, you can't understand if you don't know about this incredible saint, uh, Saint uh, Junipero Serra, and he named all these places like San Diego, so yep. many other cities, I mean, Carmel, Santa Clara, Santa Clara San Francisco. Yeah, San yeah. Francisco, I mean, just, uh, all of these different places. And if you ever think about it, a lot of people haven't reflected on it, but if you look at all the names of these places in California, they're all Catholic names, yeah. right? They're all Catholic things. Yeah. And I, I wanted Matt, because I know Matt uh, knows and has a great devotion to San Junipero Serra, but Matt uh, lived quite a lot of time in California. And so you experienced these missions in this, yeah. this culture. And so let's just talk about the importance of uh, San Junipero Serra today for people today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think St. Junipero is one of the great saints of our time. Um, and it's not surprising. And he's also, I, th I think, a saint for America, for the United States, um, and kind of a spiritual founding father of our country. Uh, so I think it's very important that we all get to know who he is and what he was about. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it is a shame, as you were saying, Tim, kind of the, the current, you know, communication around him in the media is um is 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 part of a black legend or a kind of a false history um that connects uh saint Junipero to um it, it kind of rooted in anti-catholicism rooted in uh you know some things that just aren't true and so uh you know hopefully we can talk about and unpack some of that but he uh just a just a phenomenal evangelist um and it's funny you were t I, I used to live in los angeles and, and i actually started working for the church July 1st, so the Feast of St. Junipero. Mm. I guess it was six or seven years ago now. Um, so yeah. he's been a, a special patron of mine. Yeah. And, um, but you see his legacy in California, and when you drive around California, it, even just driving through Los Angeles, it became a, a just part, prayer became part of daily life, because I'd be driving down San Vicente mm. Boulevard and say, St. Vincent, pray for us. Or yeah. I'd go visit friends in San Juan Capistrano, and you know, then you, you offer you know, uh, pray to that patron to, to pray for your time. And so everywhere you go in California, there's opportunities to pray. Now, people who oftentimes, well, until recently, with the curriculum changes, the yeah. people, but people who grew up in California got a little bit of California history, and so they learned about St. Junipero Serra. Yeah. I mean, he was in the, the textbooks of, of your history yeah. of the story of California. Yeah. And I think a lot of Americans, especially those in the Midwest and the East Coast, really, do, who, who is this guy? Yeah. He's, he's a, he came from Spain. He was a Franciscan. We'll talk about his story in, in a minute, but you know, people don't realize, for example, you mentioned San Juan Capistrano, right? Yeah. One of the mission churches and missions that he set up, and he set that up in 1776. And at the same time, there's something else going on on the east coast of America yeah, exactly. in 1776 yeah. with uh, the, you know, the, uh, the independence movement, the Declaration yeah. of Independence. And so you, we, we hear that, hist that part of our American history about 1776, but we oftentimes don't know what's going on, on the opposite side of what will become part of the United States later on, on the West Coast. And there's, you know, St. Uh, Junipero Serra establishing these missions and, you know, catechizing these Indians, the Native Americans, and baptizing them and teaching them how to farm and how to do agriculture yeah. and how to be herders so they can have a regular staple place of food so they don't have to go through feast and famine, feast and famine, yeah. right? And he's loving on them and he's risking his life and serving the Indians. And so a lot of people don't realize St. Junipero Serra plays a very prominent and important role just as, you know, a, a 
Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson, all these people on the East Coast, he's playing that role on the West Coast, isn't yep, he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I really do, I really do see him as, while it wasn't yet the United States of America, he is a founding father of a significant portion of this country. Um, yeah. And the thing you were saying with 1776, it's fascinating that St. Junipero uh, also wrote the first Bill of Rights in our country. So he wrote a Bill of Rights uh, protecting the natives, um, and he traveled from California to Mexico City to have that Bill of Rights ratified by the Viceroy and have the governor of California deposed because he was not, re he was not treating the natives fairly. So, so the first Bill of Rights in our country was actually written by Saint Junipero, not you know, not the Bill of Rights that we've come to know. Uh, you know. Yeah, it, and, and that is such a fascinating thing. And if people really understood that, they would grieve even more when they hear that the statues like would happen in San Francisco, uh, that the statue of Saint Junipero Serra was overturned at you know at the Golden Gate Park, right? Yeah. That the mob threw over that statue. Well, you know, he was not an oppressor of the Native American Indians. He was a lover. He gave his life for them. And like you said, he, he fought for them. He fought for their rights. And people don't know that. And just to give a little bit of the historical setting, at this time in the 1770s, California is part of Spain. And it's, it's part of New Spain at that point. You know? And so is Mexico. So the Spanish conquistadors have, have claimed Mexico and all of California. And, uh, and when, when the, as, the, as the Spaniards are going up in and laying claim through California, St. Junipero Cerro goes there to make sure that the Indians are treated well, but also to make sure that they're evangelized because he treats them. And this is one of the beautiful things about the Catholics, both the French Canadians in Canada and the Spanish Canadian and the, and the Sp Spanish Catholics in, in Mexico and in, 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 in California, they saw the Indians as children of God, made in the image and likeness of God, and that they had souls and that they need to be respected and treated well and also evangelized, yep. right? Now, some of the other people who came from England and the Dutch didn't treat the Indians with that kind of respect originally in Canada and in, uh, even on the East Coast and in the, well, before the colonies or as the colonies were being established. But the Catholics did. They treated the Indians with respect yep. much more than the Protestants did. I'll, I'll just say that because that's just true historically. Not the Protestant bash. I love our Protestant brothers and sisters but it was the Catholic missionaries who really saw the indigenous as being in the Imago Dei and not to be exploited. Yeah. Well, you can see that in the, the populations of Spanish, you know, uh, con like countries that were once Spanish colonies versus countries that were colonized by more Protestant countries because they, there was a, a, a largely an intermixing of the cultures. Um, you, have, you have an assimilation that took place um, in Mexico and in these areas where the Spanish who came over intermarried with the Indians, they started families, they, th things that you don't see as much in areas where Protestants came in. They saw themselves as very separate. And I think one of the advantages that the Catholics had, and this is I think to make it a fair playing field with the Protestants, is that the Protestant who, the Protestant who came over to trade and to establish and hunt, mm -hmm. they were focused on business, but th there wasn't Protestant missionaries who came with them because it was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. But what happened with the Catholics is you had Franciscans and the Jesuits who were willing, like you know, St. Brebeuf and St. Isaac Jogues who came up to, into Canada and, and the northern parts of America with the Jesuits. And you have St. Junipero Serra and his companions who were Franciscans in, in the Spanish part. They came with the, the Spanish who were you know, laying claim to this land and they protected and spoke up to these Spaniards or you know these traders for the Jesuits who were the, you know who came from France, and they they made sure that they treated the Indians as human beings. But you know there wasn't Protestant missionaries coming early on because it was too risky, but because they were celibate, because they were consecrated exactly. as Franciscans or Jesuits, they were willing to go to the with the indigenous Indians and risk hostilities. I mean, Saint Junipero Serra, his first mission in San Diego. You know, there's Indians shooting arrows, and one of his companions gets an arrow in the hand, right? Yeah. And uh, and so, uh, and then in fact, he gives last rites to a, a Spanish soldier who's dying, shot with in the throat with an arrow. Yeah. And uh, and he he runs up to Saint Junipero Serra and says, "Absolve me, Father," right, yeah. as he's dying. And there is Saint Junipero Serra there to absolve him, and he, you know he's risked his life to be there. Yeah. And it's it's a beautiful thing, and it's a testimony to 
the religious orders willing to risk everything, right? Yeah. And on the flip side of that, there's another story where uh, there was one of the natives uh, murdered somebody in the mission under St. Junipero's care. Um, another native in St. Junipero refused to, um, uh, the, he did not believe that the death penalty should be enacted on or implemented on that person, that they should have opportunity for forgiveness and being brought in. And so it's very interesting. You see on two sides, the soldier coming and begging for absolution as he's dying in St. Junipero, affording that same level mercy of mercy to, to, the Indians. to the Indians. Yeah, It's so beautiful. In fact, a after the attack in San Diego, I think I was reading uh, a, a few of the letters of Junipero and one of the accounts from somebody who mentioned that uh, St. Hinebro said, how many Indians died? And, the, and they, they said, none. And he said, good, more to be baptized. Yeah. More souls to be yeah. baptized. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so well, he looked and, at us, oh, I'm glad they didn't die, so I have a chance to baptize yeah. them and so they can be saved. By the numbers, and, and I'd love to just, well, get to telling the story of how he kind of got to California, but by the numbers, yeah. by his death. So he, he planted the cross and established San Diego um, at 50 years old, and he died at 70. Wow. So within 20 years, he established nine missions and was responsible for roughly 100,000 baptisms, 30,000 marriages, and 70,000 uh, uh, Catholic uh, kind of last rites and burials. Wow. So, I mean, you think about just the... He's really, yeah. you, I, I think it's fair to say he's an, he was an apostle to the Americas. Yeah. He was an apostle to, to America and to, uh, the apostle to California for sure yeah. is a title that we could pray to him as. Yeah. You know, and if, if anybody has family members or others in California, St. Hanipro Sarah, here we have a canonized saint uh, who did mission work in California. What a great intercessor to pray. If you have family members or others that are falling away from the church or, yeah. or part of the church, to pray to yeah. St. Uh, Hanipro Sarah to pray for them, right? Yeah. What a great intercessor we yeah. have. Well, let's back up and talk about his life. I know he's born in 1713. And let's just start with the beginning of his life and where he grows yeah. up and how he becomes to, to uh, California. Yeah, so he, he was born in Mallorca, Spain, which is an island off of the coast of Spain in the Mediterranean. And he um, entered religious life, I believe, at 16. By the age of 24, he began teaching at the most prestigious university in Mallorca. Um, uh, he taught theology and philosophy. And he taught there for roughly 10 years uh, before deciding, kind of he had a heart for uh, the missions and for the missionary work and decided to leave everything behind and set off across the ocean to the yeah, new so world. Let's just pause there because he was known for being a, a great preacher yep. and a great teacher. He, people, yep. pe his students loved him and he was established. I mean, he had basically this cushy professorship to teach theology. He was forming these young Franciscans and teaching people. I mean, he, his cup overflows, right? He's doing mission and he's a good Franciscan and yet He's really stirred up as he's hear, hearing about uh, these new lands and all these Indian tribes that are discovered and ongoing discovery, yeah. right? And he, he has a heart to, he wants to go do mission. Yeah, right? and, and one of his letters is even surviving where he, um, he uh, uh, wrote, like before he left, he wrote to his family and really took up the gospel call to leave mother, father, brother, mm -hmm. sister behind for wow. the gospel. And he acknowledges this in his letter that he says goodbye to them knowing that he'll never see them again. Wow. That this is a one directional trip. Yeah. And, um, and so just to think about that too, you know, that he's truly leaving everything behind. He's certainly leaving, yeah, leaving family like that, yeah. leaving comfort, and then risking his life. I and mean, a lot of people died on the journey yeah. over, yeah. right? And, and ships would be lost in storms. I mean, it was a precarious yeah. uh, way of travel to travel to the new world on these ships that would take months and months and you'd be at the mercy yeah. of hurricanes and yep. storms and, and it was it was quite a risk. So yep. his courage is to be noted and his generosity right away. Yeah, absolutely. And so he sets out and he, he goes to lands in Puerto Rico um, uh, and then from Puerto Rico to Veracruz, Mexico. Mm. Um, and in, in Veracruz, he did, I mean, and he had been planning this all along, but he decides to take a, a pilgrimage to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, to where she appeared. So beautiful. Yeah, and consecrate his entire mission, his priesthood, everything under her care. And just for people to get, you know, we get we talked about the travel by ship, which would be very tumultuous and difficult, and you know, uh, that's an arduous journey for months and months. In a, in, you know, and then when he gets to Veracruz, it's a 250 mile walk from Veracruz yeah. 
to 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 the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yep. And so, right. and he walked. He didn't he didn't take horseback or anything. He did the walk, um, and he got a bug bite at the time um, that became infected, and then it turned into a lesion. And so, many historians think that it's it was a cancerous lesion um, that uh, stayed with him for the rest of his life on his leg. So he walked with this wound that only wow. got worse as his life progressed. Um, and he would have been in his mid-30s at this point. Um, wow. So from mid-30s to his death at 70, he was really living out, uh, you know, taking up the cross daily with this wound on his leg and walking between it, these places. It's astonishing. And, and just to give people a sense, I mean, walking wasn't a side thing he had to do. Uh, you know, I've seen the calculation that he walked on, during his work, apostolic work here over 24,000 to 30,000 miles. Yeah, that's not that surprising, locked, it's crazy. Right, and, yeah. uh, and he reminds me of the Apostle Paul, yeah. who had to do all these journeys walking. I mean, he would do ships and risk yeah, a totally. ship and yeah. walking. Yeah. And so you see St. Junipero Serra, he's like a new St. Paul, and, yeah. and he's an apostle going to these new tribes, bringing yeah. the gospel where it's never been brought before. And yeah. that's what Paul wanted to do. And I, I can't imagine when he read the letters of St. Paul or the yeah. Acts of the Apostles, about Paul saying, I want to go to a church where the gospel hasn't been proclaimed. I mean, his heart had to just you know, fire up when yeah. he heard that because that's what he was doing. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it is a great example. It truly is who he was and what he was doing. And so he goes from Mexico City um, to Baja, California. So at the time, California was split between Baja, California, and Alta, California. So, so um, bottom California and top California. And um, uh, he worked among the people there. And then... Um, uh, something that we don't even think about in our history, but there was Russian expansion into the U.S. at this time, or into what is now the U.S. US. And so the Spanish crown was worried about the Russian expansion into California. Yeah. And so they sent a military expedition north, and St. Junipero accompanied them. Um, and the really cool thing is the military expansion allowed for the resources for St. Junipero to build the mission system. Um, but he was not beholden to the military as they moved north. So as the military established presidios, which were forts, to basically lock down the territory and protect it, St. Junipero established his missions, but he was intentional about putting the missions far away from the presidios so that the natives that would come and get re associate. support from the missions were not associating with the military aspect mm. of Sp Spain's expansion. So he wanted to separate the cross from the sword. Exactly. That's yeah. beautiful. You know, yeah. I, I remember it was the year right before we started the Augustine Day, I was preparing, and I was on a fundraising trip in California, preparing for the launch of the Augustine Day, trying to raise money. And I went with a friend who had native and uh, grew up in California, and his family actually uh, has Spanish blood. So he, he got, his family got a, a land grant from the King of Spain. Oh, wow. Uh, and so, you know, Dana Point is named after his family, great wow. guy. Um, and he took me, and I had never been, this is the first time I had been, he took me to all the nine missions. So we did a, a beautiful uh, tour for a weekend, uh, traveling to all the mission churches. And they're so beautiful, and they're in the Spanish style of a courtyard, yep. which gardens, a church, yep. you know, and then the, the buildings where that would, they'd be housed, and, and the monks and all that, and, uh, and where all the mission activity happened. It was really, really striking. And, you know, it's a great, it's just, it's, you know, sometimes we, we need to do an Augustine Zoo pilgrimage to these places because they are really worth making a pilgrimage yeah. to and doing teaching about this. But one of the things that really struck me as you were saying this, Matt, as I remember that trip and every, he tried to have a, a, a mission, a full day's walk so that he could do a full day's walk and get to a mission. And then the next mission would be further north, another yeah. full day's walk. So it's, it's roughly every 30 miles. Yeah. 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 So every, every, about every 30 miles, yeah. he, you have a mission there. And he chose two key things for his location that he chose for each mission. It had to be near a port because for, for trade and a fresh water source of water. And so what, and I think this is the genius of St. Hanipara Sarah because he wanted to bring the Indians in. He wanted to evangelize them and so he built the mission churches where there was a fresh source of water. In other words, it would be a great place for farming and he wanted to teach the Indians how to farm yep. so that they would have food. And so by building the, the church in a agricultural center and where you have an economic center yep. he wanted to plant the gospel right in the heart of the economic life in other words the life of people 
Yeah. And uh, it, and that's just such a lesson for us today, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think of it, it was it was a new evangelization of, for its time, yeah. and, and it's a model that we can follow in our efforts to do the new evangelization today, which was largely, he he looked at what would be attractive to bring people in. He taught them skills that bettered their lives. He taught them the truth. He taught them farming. He taught them, you know, uh, uh, various trades. Um, and uh, and provided care for them, and then and then the really interesting thing too is is it was he he created dialogue and opportunity for mm -hmm. for encounter because the mission system then became as the Spanish laity moved north, they settled around the missions, not the presidios, so they settled close to the the sacramental life and the church life, not the military life, um, mm -hmm. and they intermixed with the Indians and there was encounter and dialogue and a great blending of cultures and a bettering of cultures as a result of St. Junipero's early work. It's such, it's, it's, it's such a great model and he wanted the missions to be self-sufficient, yeah. you know, to be able to fund themselves yeah. so that they could grow and expand. Yeah. And uh, that kind of entrepreneurial sense of evangelization, all for mission. Uh, I just really, really appreciate yeah. that. I thought yeah. that was just brilliant. Well, and you think about these, these like uh, using the agricultural analogy, but these seeds that were planted of faith in these 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 beautiful missions mm. um, have become major cities. So it's like that fertile ground has has spread into these these yeah. major metropolitan areas, um, and and so it's it, in in all centered around kind of Saint Francis and Catholic saints. So so the city of Los Angeles, for example, the name that Saint, that it was named, um, the mission, mm. the first mission Saint Junipero started there was the San Gabriel mission, named after the Archangel Gabriel. But then Los Angeles grew from there, and the name of Los Angeles was El Pueblo de la Nuestra Señora la Reina de Los Angeles de Portiuncula. So this, the town of Our Lady, Queen of the Angels of Portiuncula, which was the church where the Franciscan order began. And then right. San and Francisco. It's so important for the life of St. Yeah. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. And here you have this great son of St. Francis yeah. who's naming all these places, even exactly. his own name, yeah. you know, his his his. his Baptismal name was Miguel, yeah. and he takes the name Junipero because that was the name of one of Francis's early companions yeah. and close companions, and he wanted to be a close companion to Francis, and he really lived that. He lived that poverty, yeah. and he lived that charity that Francis yeah, lived. Exactly, and then San Francisco, obviously, uh, is named after St. Francis, and yeah. Dolores Mission, if you're ever in San Francisco, Dolores Mission was a mission founded by St. Junipero, and Santa Clara, so St. Clair, so Francis and Clair together on different parts of the Bay Area, Santa Clara was a, a sister mission to the San Francisco mission. So they were right there, which was pretty neat. Too. It's so beautiful. And I, I, I'm amazed at how many people, even people in California who are great Catholics, don't know this story yeah. well. Yeah. And we need to know the story because I think, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, there's people who think, well, you know, I know that there was a beautiful statue of St. Junipero Serra in the state capitol yeah. in California, right? And uh, as well as many places like in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Park. And that one was tragically overturned uh, by the mob who just yeah. wanted to get rid of him. And I think people, the accusation is, well, he's just part of this European story of oppressing the native indigenous yeah. Indians. And let's just talk about that. And, and I feel like it's, you know, we should give a little yeah. defense to St. Hinebra oh. because he really deserves it. Yeah, we absolutely should. You know, and, the, and it wasn't just the the... Golden Gate Park statue, the statue at Placito Olvera in Los Angeles, so in the heart of LA, was overturned oh. and had paint poured on it. Um, they tried to take down the one in Ventura, so at the Ventura Mission, which he founded, but a number of Catholics rallied around that and actually were able to defend the statue and prevent it from being torn down. Praise God. What a yeah. beautiful witness those Catholics did of protecting yeah. San yeah. Junipero. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. And, uh, and that's sometimes we just have to show up. Yeah. And just and, and be a witness, and and you know, and, and those people that 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 angry mob that wanted to tear it down, yeah. they didn't. Yeah. I heard, and they people just prayed, and yeah. that's the power of prayer yeah. and witness, right? Yeah, and I think in defending Saint Junipero, we have to first acknowledge the pain and suffering that Native Americans have encountered in our country, and uh, some of the ills that have accompanied col colonial kind of expansion, and and all of those things, and unfortunately without fully understanding the history, it's easy to lump all of those things together. Um, and St. Junipero has been included in yeah. kind of this, this overarching narrative 
of the subjugation of native peoples. Yeah, that's so important. And yeah. the two things I'd say to that is, you know, the Portuguese, the British, the French, and the Spanish came over here looking for fortune and, and, and trade routes and, and, and trade. But we have to separate those people going out, those nation states and those people from the missionaries, the Jesuits and yeah. the Franciscans that we, yeah. like we talked about earlier, who came not to gain but to give. Yeah. And a lot of them gave their lives. Yeah. You know, whether in a white martyrdom like St. Junipero yeah. or a red martyrdom like St. Isaac Jogues. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And so in defense of St. Junipero, um, there, there was, um, you know, some of the critiques against him were that there was corporal punishment in the mission system. Um, and that is true. Um, for rule breaking or things like that, there was corporal punishment, but that's largely something that was used for everyone during that time. So it yeah. was no different than the Franciscan brothers. The Franciscan brothers underwent the they same punishment. They did that for themselves. Yeah. As they the didn't natives. treat the Indians Ex less any than. different. Exactly. And that's so important. Yeah. And, and of course, the Indians also did. Remember, it wasn't just the, the Europeans who came over and treated the Indians bad. The Indians, think about the Aztecs. Yeah. The Indian tribes fought each other. And it wasn't paradise. It wasn't like the Garden of Eden, and then the Europeans came and destroyed Eden. Yeah. Um, and that's just important. Human yeah. nature being what it is, yeah. we know from our Catholic story, we're all fallen. Yeah. And uh, without the grace of God, we don't treat people well. Yeah. And the, the, other, the other issue is that um, uh, to remember is St. Is Junipero's defense of the yeah. Indian that committed murder. So he, was, he did not implement any form of capital punishment. He defended and showed mercy to all people. Um, and also uh, at, at, the, at his funeral, so he's buried, if you ever want to visit him, mm -hmm. um, he's buried in the mission at Carmel. Um, so you can go and visit the tomb of St. Junipero. But the, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, his funeral was said to have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of natives who showed up to honor this man who loved them so much, many of whom were not natives living in the mission system. So they were still in their tribal areas around the missions. They had not yet converted, and yet they still had such respect for this man that they showed up to his funeral. You know, that's the ultimate test, is not that, you know, later generations build a statue in honor of him or that his confers honor him, but rather that the people he served honored him. There's no greater honor than to be honored by those you serve. And that's the true testament to yeah. uh, his, his sainthood and, uh, and the kind of character he had. I, one of the things I love is I, I was reading a correspondence of one of his uh, best friends who he did the missions with and he came out there with, uh, I, I want to say uh, Father Paul or yeah. uh, Paulo. Yeah. Uh, he mentioned that he, he heard that, you know, St. Junipero was getting sick and ill and he came down to visit him. And, uh, and the Indians were very concerned about him. But when he came down, St. Junipero was singing, was leading the singing in the, in the church with all these Native American Indians, a hymn of praise and honor to Our Lady, to the Blessed Mother. And he heard his voice and how loud and boisterous it was. And he said to one of the Spanish uh, soldiers, he said, he doesn't sound like he's on his, you know, he's yeah. very ill. And he's sounding very robust. And he says, oh, uh, Father Paula, Saint, you know, he said, Father Hinepro Sarah, he always sings and prays loudly, but then afterwards he's very weak. So don't let, don't be fooled. He's very sickly, but yeah. whenever he prays, he comes alive in a whole new way. And yeah. I, I just thought that was a beautiful testimony yeah. of his character and his love. And I just imagine all these Indians singing in beautiful Latin, the Regina Chaley, you know, <laughs> it, it just... Uh, you know, what a beautiful, beautiful yeah. image, right? Yeah. Well, we've got about a minute left. What were yeah, your last I, thoughts, man? I guess I would, I would end with just that, that St. Junipero's life was a song to Our Lady. Mm. And, um, and, and those songs are short, you, you know, like in the short amount of time that he lived from, yeah. from in becoming a capuchin and going to Our Lady of Guadalupe and setting up these missions named after Our Lady. And he really sang a song to Our Lady. And that song continues today in the life of the church. So, oh, that's yeah. a that's a beautiful image, and I you know I, I love the great motto of Saint Junipero Serra. He said, "Always forward, never back." And you don't look back. You don't look at the problems. You don't look at the mistakes of the past. You go forward. And 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 you know that saint's advice to us is great advice. Don't get caught up. The devil wants you to look in your past and be discouraged. But Saint Junipero Serra says, "Don't look back. Look forward. Always forward." We always want to move forward with Christ, with hope. And that's what we need to do today. We need to follow his advice. And let's pray to him for his intercession. 
and let's imitate his charity to those who could be hostile and yet he wanted to love them and he wasn't afraid of that hostility. He wanted to bring them to Christ. Let's bring all those who are hostile to the faith. Let's bring them to Christ and to the love of Jesus. Thank you so much and God bless you.